The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, early childhood advocate Simon Workman explains why progressive Democrats should pay more attention to early childhood. Veteran politician Joseph Tidings talks about his new book, My Life in Progressive Politics, Against the Grain. And Bill Press gets a political reading from Kyle Kondik, managing director of Sabato's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Simon Workman works on policy solutions that will improve the lives of children. It's an issue, he says, that affects all Americans and tells us how voters can make politicians accountable. And we say hello to Simon Workman, who's the associate editor of Early Childhood Policy at American Progress. Recently, he co-authored an agenda that outlines 10 early childhood ideas for state policymakers. Simon Workman, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure to have you with us. Before we talk about your ideas, let's talk about the context. What are the issues and challenges facing parents across the country as they deal with child care uh, choices? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. There are a lot of issues that families are facing, and this isn't just an issue for low-income families. It's also an issue for for middle-class families, for middle-income families. You know, almost two-thirds of children have all available parents in the workforce, so, you know, there is a huge need for childcare, but it's really hard to find childcare. It's really hard to find childcare that you can afford. This is often the first or second largest expense in a family's budget. You know, childcare can cost more than $10,000 per year, even more for, for young kids, for infants and toddlers. Um, and that's just really making it unaffordable for so many families. And then they're forced to make tough choices. You know, either they have to pick care that doesn't fully meet their needs. Maybe they're choosing unlicensed childcare or they're, they're relying on family members, grandparents. They're what we call it weaving together a patchwork of care um, to try and cover all the hours that they need care for. Or, you know, we see parents dropping out of the workforce, and it's often the mother, so this has a disproportionate effect on on, on women. Um, and, you know, they're dropping out of the workforce. You're not just losing the income for the few years when you're out of the workforce looking after your kids, but that has a long-term impact on your career trajectory and your retirement savings, et cetera, et cetera. So we really see this is a huge issue that when people can't access affordable and high-quality childcare, it really has an economic impact on, on the entire family. Absolutely. Now, as I mentioned, this agenda that that you co-authored outlines 10 early childhood ideas. Let's begin with idea number one on your list. Ensure that every parent pays no more than 7% of their income for high quality child care. What would it take at a policy level to make this happen? Well, honestly, it, it takes a significant public investment. You know, you need a new public subsidy that really uh, provides uh, the level of support that is actually needed to, to develop a, a full early childhood system. You know, we currently in this country have the child care uh, development block grant, which is the main child care assistance, but it only covers one in six eligible children. And the eligibility levels are so low that only really the lowest income families qualify. And even then, the amount of the subsidy is barely enough to cover the cost of the program. So, you know, the first thing we do from a policy point of view is understand how much does it really cost to provide high quality child care? So that's child care that meets high standards and that pays teachers a, a decent wage. And then what we need is a public investment that can cover the gap between what parents can afford to pay and this actual cost of providing the service. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, they define affordable childcare as being 7% of family income. And we agree, really, that that's a good benchmark. But what we see is there should be a sliding scale below that so that the lowest families, the lowest income families pay nothing. And then there's an there's a increase in the family contribution as your income 
uh, increases. And we've seen this happen in a number of cities and states for preschool programs where they have a sliding income scale to, to sort of show what the subsidy amount should be. Um, but we believe that can be applied to this larger comprehensive childcare system that really also supports infants and toddlers and really says, you know, families are making a contribution, but, but the public is providing, there's a public good providing the money for, for the lowest income families. You know, another idea, pay early educators a living wage. What kind of a difference would this make? Uh, this would make a huge difference. I mean, early childhood educators, they currently earn an average of $10 per hour. You know, most could make more working in fast food restaurants. Uh, studies have shown that about 40% of the early childhood workforce relies on public assistance at some point in their lives. You know, and even when teachers have a four-year degree, have advanced credentials, we see that early childhood is one of the lowest earning professions. And that leaves these teachers, most of them are living in poverty. They can't even support their own families. And this provides a lot of economic anxiety. You know, and as you can imagine, this has a negative impact on the kids who are in their care. You know, it's, it's hard to provide the best experience for, your, for, for the children in your care if you're worried about where your own children's next meal is coming from. Um, you know, so what we've, we've seen is that the, the, the early childhood industry we have right now is built on the backs of this predominantly female workforce and the low wages they receive. Like the own industry only works in the way that it works right now because these, these teachers are earning so little. So, you know, when we talk about paying them a living wage, you can remove this anxiety and you can really demonstrate the value that these educators bring. You know, this is not babysitting anymore. We're talking about uh, providing high quality care. You know, children begin learning from birth. Every single interaction a kid has with an adult, you know, as any parent will tell you, you know, kids are constantly learning. And so every interaction is a learning opportunity. But to make that really uh, a, a value in the early childhood space, you need well-skilled, you need credentialed teachers who have some experience. And to do that, it needs to be a profession. And if you're paying people $10 per hour, it's not a profession, it's just a job. And so when we talk about paying them a, a, a wage that is a livable wage, you know, we're not talking about high salaries, we're talking about enough compensation so they can make a career out of this. They can invest in themselves. We can invest in advanced training that people will stay in the field. You won't have high turnover and, you know, really valuing these people for the way, for the work that they're doing, which is really developing, you know, the next generation of, of, of Americans of our future workforce. Mm -hmm. and, and as you say, these are early educators. They're not babysitters. I mean, my niece makes $10 Absolutely. an hour babysitting. Absolutely. That's, you know, so that's, you know, something to be right to be taken into consideration. We're speaking to Simon Workman, Associate Director of Early Childhood Policy at American Progress, recently co-authored an agenda that outlines 10 early childhood ideas for state policymakers. And we're just touching on a few of them here today. Idea number five, Simon, give parents more options by reducing health, by reducing child care deserts. What is a child care desert and where are they most likely to exist? Yeah, so childcare deserts is basically a community where demand for childcare exceeds supply, um, either because there are no licensed childcare providers or just very few. And this is a term that we at the Center for American Progress coined a couple of years ago, um, kind of based on the idea of food deserts that I think is an idea that people understand. And so we kind of use that as this framing for childcare deserts. And then last year, we actually analyzed data from 22 states, which covered about two thirds of the US population. And that study found that uh, just over half, about 51% of people in these states lived in what we termed a childcare desert. Um, you know, and what we found was for Hispanic families and for families in rural areas, they were much more likely to be in childcare deserts. So the rate for Hispanic families was about 57% compared to about 50% for the overall population. Um, you know, and again, in rural areas, it was higher where there really are very few cho choices for families when they're looking for childcare. And, you know, it's these communities, it's these families who we see struggling the most, right? Because they're still working, so they're still needing childcare, but they're forced to weave together some sort of patchwork of care. You know, they're relying on unlicensed care that doesn't necessarily meet health and safety standards. They're relying on friends and family, you know, or they're dropping out of the workforce, the kind of issues we were talking about before. Um, so, so through this analysis we've done around childcare deserts and, and this suggestion here, this policy idea in the paper is really saying you first need to identify the childcare deserts, find out where they are, which, which parts of your state really have these communities where there's this need, and then figure out what's the best solution. You know, the best solution might be we need to build more childcare centers, we need to invest in infrastructure, but it also could be supporting informal programs, supporting the unlicensed programs to become licensed, to meet those state standards, to make sure they're meeting the 
the health and safety requirements we need. Or it's because there's a lack of well-trained educators, right? And so maybe the best investment is investing in the early childhood workforce. So there's actually these well-trained and credentialed teachers out there who can, can open a childcare centre, can staff a childcare centre, can provide the support that the families in these areas really need. Mm-hmm. Now, another idea, end suspensions and expulsions in preschools. Yeah. I mean, some people, <laughs> myself included, might be surprised that this practice exists. Tell us how and where this happens and why you're taking a stand against it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, this is an issue that's way more prevalent than people realize. Um, you know, you don't think of children this young being suspended and expelled. Um, but, you know, analysis we recently conducted found that an average of 250 preschoolers are suspended or expelled every single school day in the U.S., you know, which is just so high when you think about it. And what we found was it's also disproportionately uh, affecting African-American preschoolers. They are to a, to about just over two times more likely to be expelled than other children. And And boys as well. Boys are more likely to be expelled or suspended. You know, boys make up about 51% of the preschool population, but they receive 82% of the suspensions and expulsions. So, you know, if you're African-American and you're a boy, you're you're really facing a disproportionate amount of suspensions and expulsions here. And, you know, these practices, as you can imagine, they have long-term negative consequences for these kids. You know, this is a time when kids are they're first being exposed to the formal education environment, you know, into the sort of idea of a preschool. And then if they're suspended or expelled, they're excluded, you know, that clouds their perception of school forever, right? And their, their love of learning is, is totally cut off from an early age and their social emotional development is hindered. You know, and, and, and we've, we've talked about the prison to preschool pipeline before. And, you know, this is often seen as the first stage of that where, you know, it sets kids off on this kind of slippery slope. So, you know, what, what our idea here in this paper was to, to sort of follow what a number of states have started to do recently, which is to actually pass a bill, pass a law to outlaw uh, suspensions or expulsions to stop uh, preschools from doing them um, and, and to really then invest some funds in policies and resources that actually help teachers deal with these issues, right? Because if there's, if there's a kid acting up, if there's something happening, it's much better for the teacher to have training in crucial social emotional skills, in helping kids f- figure out sharing, turn taking, coping with emotions, etc., and actually work with them in the classroom rather than suspending or expelling them. So, you know, what we think is we should give the teachers the resources to deal with these problems and deal with them in the classroom, not just removing the kids and, and, and kind of leaving them into this then wasteland where, where who knows what happens to them. Absolutely. Now, these ideas, of course, are directed at state politicians and policymakers. Is there anything you want to see happen at the national level? Yeah, I mean, ideally, we'd be in a position where there'd be a national response to a lot of these issues, right? And, and, and this is definitely something before the last election that got talked about a lot. Um, you know, you need something that addresses the multiple issues, the affordability, the access, the quality, the workforce, you know, and you really need a significant public investment for that. Uh, last year, Senator Paddy Murray and uh, Representative Bobby Scott in the House introduced the Child Care for Working Families Act, um, which would provide financial assistance to working families to help them afford childcare um, and would actually cap the amount that people would pay for childcare at 7% of their income. Um, it would also help increase pay for teachers, provide funds to increase the quality of programs and help parents access care outside of the traditional nine to five schedule, right, to help families who are who are working, you know, nights and evenings and weekends, et cetera. Um, you know, so that's this kind of the, the progressive ideal, we would say, the Child Care for Working Families Act. You know, last week in the spending bill, um, uh, Congress uh, increased funding for the Child Care Development Block Grant, which is great. I mean, that's a, a great increase in spending and a great win for the early childhood community. But really, it's not enough. It only goes a small part of the way. So we see that as a great down payment towards a comprehensive solution as proposed in the in the Child Care for Working Families Act. But there's still a lot more to do uh, to meet the need at the national level. And while doing right by children is usually a bipartisan and popular idea, it still takes a commitment of public funds. How high is that hill right now? Well, yeah, it is a big hill, um, especially at the federal level with the current administration. You know, I don't think uh, we're, we're realistic about expecting any major investment of, of funds at the federal level. You know, a recent 
National Academies of Science report just came out that kind of estimated the cost to to fund the overall early childhood system and, and called for about another 50 to $60 billion of, of public investment each year. Uh, you know, so we know that's a big hill, but that's partly why we put this paper out looking at what can be done at the state level, because we really see that this is something that states can address and should address. And, you know, at the state level, I do think there's still a more of a level of bipartisanship that that, that we can see uh, some progress on this issue. Um, you know, we really see this as an economic development issue. And I think that's something that governors and state legislators can really get behind. You know, if you invest early, you're saving money in the long term. There's been plenty of studies about the return on investment of early childhood, you know, some as high as $13 for every $1 invested. But, you know, even the lower ones at three or four, five dollars for every dollar invested, that's still a good rate on return. Um, and I think for states at the state level, a lot of those savings are in the K-12 years or they're, they're, they're very immediate um, for states. And then when you look at the workforce, when you look at developing the workforce of the future, you know, we hear governors a lot talk about being the chief executive right of their state and, and, and looking at it kind of like running a business. Well, you know, one of the smartest things you can do is investing in young children. It's a huge win. It's a win for the current generation who have got their kids in the in the childcare ride and they can now afford to work. They have more money in their pocket because it's not going to childcare. And it's a win for the future generation who are getting the kind of development uh, early on that's going to make them succeed later on in life. What are the kind of kinds of questions you want voters to ask their candidates as we approach November to advance the quality of life for children? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is for voters to talk about this issue, right? We need voters to to tell candidates that this is an issue for them, that it's a priority for them, that, you know, that, that child care is something that, that would help uh, swing their vote, say, you know, and saying, like, making sure that politicians and the candidates understand how this is an issue for families and how this is an issue, and it's an issue for all families, right? Not just low income families. This is an issue that many, many middle income families, middle class families are dealing with on a day to day basis. So I think the first point is like educating your candidates and making sure they understand this issue, understand how much you're paying for childcare, understand the impact of, of the current childcare system is actually having on you. And then making sure that they they have a plan that's comprehensive. I think too often we see people talking about early childhood and only talking about preschool. And I think, you know, it's important that uh, people push them on that and show this isn't just about preschool. Learning begins at birth. It's not just babysitting. You know, families need support from the day their child is born, right? Especially if we don't have uh, good paid family leave policies, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you need a policy response that's going to be comprehensive, that's going to support all families, that's going to support kids at each stage of their life, and that's going to support uh, the early childhood workforce as well. So I think, you know, that's our biggest thing is to say, make sure you're pushing people for a comprehensive policy, a comprehensive solution that really provides this increased level of investment that's needed at such a, a critical time in young children's lives. Absolutely. Simon Workman, Associate Director of Early Childhood Policy at American Progress, joining us today and again, co-authored the agenda that outlines 10 early childhood ideas for state policymakers. Simon, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. 
whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, one writer called him the anti-Trump. Former Senator Joseph Tidings looks back on a life in progressive politics. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Greed is good, proclaimed Gordon Gecko, lead character in a 1987 film lampooning the low ethics of the high finance barons of Wall Street. You might think that surely this Hollywood portrayal is a gross exaggeration. But check out an egregious example of gecko-level greed being pushed by today's Wall Street sharks. Big-shot financiers have been going all out to kill a sensible Labor Department rule meant to protect people's retirement accounts from the self-serving guile of financial manipulators. The rule simply requires firms that manage these accounts to put our money in investments expected to produce the best returns for us, rather than in investments that pay the highest interest fees to them. It's hardly harsh to require them to treat us common customers with basic honesty, applying what amounts to a golden rule for bankers. But, oh, howls of outrage exploded from the Wall Street baronies. Lobbyists swarmed into Washington, and scores of lawyers rushed into courts. To defend their right to be dishonest, the greed-fueled bankers resorted to more dishonesty, claiming that the fiduciary rule would hurt, quote, smaller investors. Huh? Well, they prevaricated. Only by misdirecting small retirement savers into high-fee investments can we make enough profit to give, quote, affordable financial advice to workaday folks. Again, huh? These banks are wallowing in unconscionable levels of profits, but the only affordable advice they want to offer us is bad advice, funneling our retirement stash into deals that benefit them at our expense. This is Jim Hightower saying, bankers claiming that they have a legal right to profit by cheating their own customers is a level of gluttony so gross that it would even gag Gordon Gecko. For more information, go to consumerfed.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Joseph Tidings spent his entire life in politics fighting corruption and promoting progressive ideals. It's a career that began over 50 years ago when he took a bold stand against segregation. And we say hello to Joseph Tidings, retired American lawyer, politician, and former Democratic member of the United States Senate. Representing the state of Maryland from 1965 to 1971, his new autobiography is titled My Life in Progressive Politics Against the Grain. Senator Tidings, thanks for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. My pleasure. My pleasure, Jim. And our pleasure to have you with us. You know, your book chronicles a remarkable life fighting for progressive issues. It's impossible, of course, to cover all of that in one interview. That said, we are going to start by going way back in time. According to the Baltimore Sun, one of your first political battles took place in the 1950s when you were a leader with the Maryland Young Democrats and you faced down an Ocean City hotel owner who was barring African-Americans from his establishment. Can you tell us that story? Yes, I, uh, I helped organize the Young Democrats in Maryland, and I was statewide president at the time, and we had a, uh, uh, a session in Ocean City, Maryland. Now, at that time, there was no hotel or restaurant, white restaurant or white hotel in Maryland would have permit a, um, an African-American to come in and have supper. The only place my uh, African-American colleague who was in law school could get and I studied with good only place we could eat together was in the, the, with the railroad station <laughs> because it was President Truman had to, had to, you know, get done away with the uh, 
with uh, segregation and and railroad stations or what have you. In any event, we had a uh, uh, a two day session down in Ocean or one day session in Ocean City, and we and we had a hotel and which we used and um, we we had a number we had a, a big and we had a big dinner and they they could make their money on the dinner. But um, I had brought, I had in, in increased the, the size of the Young Democrats, or I recruited African Americans into the Young Democratic clubs of Maryland and had them down at um, Ocean City. The uh, <laughs> the owner of the hotel said, "Well, you can have your dinner down here. We want your dinner and what have you, but you can't have any of your African American or colored." Uh, delegates at the dinner. We just don't do that down here in Eastern Shore. <laughs> I said, well, you better make think of your things because if it's not, I'm pulling the whole convention out of your hotel and mm-hmm. we'll go elsewhere. And I was. I mean, I would have pulled it out of there. And in any event, they uh, backed off. <laughs> they let us all have. Everybody came in and had dinner and what have you. So that, wow. and my, my mother, my mother was felt very strongly on human rights, civil rights, and I did too. So anyway, go ahead. Well, it's a, it's, it's pretty fascinating, especially when you think about the time in, 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 in our history, uh, that, that you were taking that on. And that's, that's, that's commendable beyond words. Um, your official political career began in the Maryland House of Delegates, where you served for seven years. That's also where you began taking on corruption in politics, which is not always the most politically rewarding path to take. What drove you there? Well, I, I think I, I was fortunate. I was adopted by a great United States Senator, Miller Titus. And I have, a, you know, when you're an adopted, you have a sort of different outlook. And so his record in government and public service was a huge uh, motivation for me. Uh, plus, my mother's father was a, a Democrat from Wisconsin, worked for Woodrow Wilson, worked for Franklin Roosevelt, later became U.S. ambassador. And um, I, I was motivated by, I guess, t- tremendous family um, uh, persons who, who I had my great respect. In 1961, you became a federal prosecutor where you continued to root out political corruption. This is, of course, during the Kennedy administration, and at times there may have been some buyer's remorse, if you will. You recall a story in your book when Attorney General Robert Kennedy called and said to you, and I quote, my God, Joe, can't you ever find a Republican to indict? Um, how hard was it to do your job and stay free of the political pressure? Well, actually, it wasn't hard at all because I had a wonderful attorney general to work for, Robert Kennedy. Had I had any other attorney general in, in modern history, they would not have permitted me to investigate indict and prosecute two Democratic congressmen of my own party. One of the ones that I investigated and indicted should have been indicted three times before, but each time a U.S. attorney had set something up and had been killed in the Department of Justice. And I would not have been permitted to go forward with mine if the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division, both of whom were, were thought it was too, uh, too sensitive to allow me to send the FBI and, and go ahead and take documents of two sitting Democratic congressmen with a Democratic attorney general, Democratic president. They would not have permitted it. But Robert Kennedy said, go ahead. Wow. We're speaking with Joseph Tidings, retired American lawyer, politician, former Democratic member of the United States Senate, representing the state of Maryland. And his new autobiography is titled My Life in Progressive Politics Against the Grain. 
Senator, in 1964, you ran for U.S. Senate, served for six years. And there, one of the most well-known stories of your career unfolds. You introduced the Firearms Registration and Licensing Act that would have mandated registration of all purchased guns and created licensing requirements to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and chronic substance abusers. And while you may not have expected the bill to pass, you could not have foreseen that it would actually end your career in Congress. What happened after you introduced the bill? Well, a a, a number of of things. Um, I knew knew that the the bill was going to be very, very uh, costly because the National Rifle Association by that time had uh, taken control of all the hunting groups in the nation. Um, I, I realized that, but when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, I just felt that the time had come that somebody had to take him on. And uh, I did. When you lose by 11,000 votes, there are many things that, uh, that enter into it. And I think perhaps one of the things is I was out in front on so many issues. I was the United States Senator who for five weeks protected Thurgood Marshall who was being not, who had been nominated for Supreme Court Justice in the Democratic Judiciary Committee with the, the leading Democrats there trying to uh, uh, do everything they could to prevent him from being confirmed as Supreme Court Justice. So, I, you know, I, I was in front of, and a lot of issues. You know, some people might say this story about your experience with gun reform is a cautionary tale for today's politicians who are trying to do the same thing. Do you see it that way? I think the situation is much, much, much better today. I think the Parkland tragedy, uh, which has fired up young women and young men across the country to get involved in politics and the women involved and the young men involved running for Congress and what have you since that time have made a huge difference. So I think the situation today is better for someone like myself or someone trying to protect people with response by enacting responsible gun control is better today than it has been in, uh, in my lifetime. Okay. Now, in addition to gun control, you fought for many other progressive causes during your time in Congress, such as civil rights and environmental protection. What lessons did you learn that can offer guidance to progressive politicians today? And do you think there is a limit to how progressive a politician can be and still be successful? Well, I think you have to do um, you you have to vote your conscience if you're in a Senate now. Uh, had my father been alive, he might have uh, cautioned me on going out way out in front on so many issues. For instance, on the Vietnam War, I was opposed to the Vietnam War, and I got out in front on the national debates. And, and the veterans groups in Maryland that normally would be for me because I was a veteran and what have you, Took it, took it personally. Senator Mathias, Republican senator, who had took the same position as I did, but he was smart enough <laughs> or politically sagacious enough to keep his mouth shut about it and <laughs> the right way, but never say anything. So nobody thought he was a target. I, uh, uh, I, I was the one nationally that got on television and, and, and spoke against the Vietnam War. So I think that if you're going to get involved in in issues like I do, you have to have a little more judgment about how far out in front you can be and how you're out in front. But, uh, you know, that's the way it is. Well, you know, I think on the other hand, um, you stood up for and stayed in the same position for what you believed. And uh, I, I think our world would be in a lot better place if more politicians today did the same thing. Uh, You are a step-grandson of Marjorie Merriweather Post, who built Mar-a-Lago, otherwise known as Donald Trump's Winter White House. It was there that she had a motto carved in stone beneath her family's or her father's family crest, and it said one word, integritas, the Latin word for integrity and honesty. Donald Trump replaced the crest with his own and the word Trump. 
you spent a lot of time at Mar-a-Lago as a child. What has it been like for you to see not only Mar-a-Lago, but the White House itself inhabited by such a different sense of values? Well, um, I uh, obviously, uh, I feel very strongly about Mr. Trump. I, I think he's a national tragedy when, it, when he was elected president. I don't think he's fit to be president. Uh, the um, the, the, the uh, crest was given to my grandfather, Master Joseph Davies, by the British College of Heralds. <laughs> it's a beautiful crest, and as you pointed out on the bottom, it has integritas, which means integrity. Well, <laughs> he took out integrity, integritas, and put in Trump. Um, I had people, actually, when I, that was came out in public in, in Great Britain, they discovered, and I had, I had people from Canada call me and offer to put up the money if I wanted to sue Trump. Well, uh, growing up in a, in a farm, as I did, working a farm every summer, you're wise enough you don't get in a pissing duel with a skunk. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel that way about uh, Trump. I, um, it, it was a national tragedy that he's our president, but uh, he won't be president too long. His day is coming. We, we can all hope, and we, and, we, and we will all hope with fingers crossed as well. Joseph Tidings, retired American lawyer, politician, former Democratic member of the United States Senate, representing the state of Maryland. His new autobiography is titled My Life in Progressive Politics Against the Grain. Senator Tidings, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you very much for your time. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Kyle Kondik of Sabato's Crystal Ball on the state of play in electoral politics. On the political front, nobody knows it better than Kyle Kondik and Larry Sabato down at the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, Kyle Kondik joins us in studio. Kyle, it's always good to see you. Good to be here, Bill. Welcome back. Uh, John Boehner yesterday out in Michigan at a little uh, confab said, there is no longer a Republican Party. It is now the Trump Party. Uh, I think that's probably right. And certainly the president continues to have very strong approval ratings, at least amongst Republicans. His national numbers are a little bit better, but still definitely under 45 percent. Um, but, uh, you know, amongst Republicans, it's, you know, 80, 85, 90 percent approval. Uh, I think you're seeing uh, that the Republicans are sort of more rallying around the president than being critical of him. Uh, there was some uh, criticism of the president yesterday for some of these uh, uh, steel tariffs. Yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, I think that, that the Republican Party has been pretty supportive of him, uh, right. g- given, given, some of his be- <laughs> given some of his behavior. Right. I mean, it is amazing that, I mean, uh, the... So much opposition to him as a candidate, right? right? Uh, and then maybe initially in in the presidency, but um, of course Boehner hasn't been around. But um, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, I mean, you name it, they've all just basically rolled over, right? You know, I, I was I've been thinking about this, and I was thinking about this during the during the 2014 midterm with the pre, with Obama as president, and I felt like, you know, at times it felt like Democrats were trying to distance themselves from Obama, which totally made sense. Of course, there were a bunch of red state Democrats uh, running for Senate that year. Of course, they basically all lost. Um, but I sometimes wondered if, you know, because the president's approval rating is so important in the midterm, if as a party you sort of rally around the president and try to promote him and try to make sure that his his approval rating stays up as high as it can be. Is that like the better strategy in a midterm environment than running away from the president? And to me, actually, the Republicans are kind of doing that in that they're they're they are really rallying around Trump and they're trying to do things 
that help him help himself help his numbers and and I you know the old cliche you know the rising tide lifts all boats yeah uh, and you know if the president is is at forty five forty six percent approval that's the scenario in which the, the Republicans probably will win the House or hold but the House. There was this theory for a time. That, okay, look, Donald Trump is who he is. He's not really a Republican. He's just sui generis. And so we'll, you know, we'll kind of suffer through this. And then we'll get back to the Republican Party as we know it and love it. And the establishment, if you will, Republican Party. I I don't think that's true anymore. No, I I don't think it's true either. The Republican, the old Republican Party that we knew ain't coming back. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I agree. And also, you know, we've seen these important sort of. Demographic trends over the years, particularly uh, the the uh, migration or the increased migration of uh, white voters who do not have a four year college degree becoming more and more Republican over time. And that has sort of changed the character of the Republican Party a little bit because some of the the four year college educated white voters have trended in the Democratic Party. The Republican Party, I think, has become a little bit more of a blue collar party. And I think Trump is a great example of like what that kind of Republican might look like. Right, just now, maybe thinking. maybe a, a sort of extreme version of it, but but um, wh- where that where that party is heading. And it's not just that the leadership of the party has changed. It's that the base of the party has changed, too. And again, this is this predates Trump. This is the last. Couple and I'm of thinking of who it, it were the establishment Republican Party, classic George W. Bush party to come back. Who would be the person to bring it back? Well, Jeff Flake is retiring. Right. Bob Corker is leaving. John McCain, sadly, is not going to be around that much longer. Uh, who, who, you know, you know, John, I mean, John Kasich seems to want to run for president. John although, Kasich, yeah. one, one interesting thing about Kasich is that you know he's he's leaving office in Ohio after term limits, and um, you know his numbers are now such that. He's actually arguably more popular with Democrats now than he is with Republicans, which would have been an insane thing to suggest when he oh, started yeah. his governorship because he was very yeah, unpopular. Yeah. Remember the labor legislation? He started out right yeah. for that labor. And, uh, and now he's like this kumbaya figure, although, you know, if he, if he could run for a third term, I think he would win it. But I don't think he get, could have gotten renominated. So mm-hmm. it's just— And it, then yeah. Mitt Romney, who was a very outspoken critic of Trump, right. has now he's basically just gone south because he— Wants to be in the United States Senate. Yep. Which he'll... Seems like he will be. Seems like he will be. Uh, Some breaking political news overnight from Alaska. Uh, So former Senator Mark Begich, a Democrat who served for a single term, beat Ted Stevens in uh, the 2008 uh, Senate race and lost a pretty close race in in 2014. He is running for... To... to, uh, 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 Not uh, Lisa. The other uh, one. uh, uh, Dan Sullivan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, he is um, going to be uh, running for governor in Alaska. Uh, and it is, Alaska is interesting in that it's the only state that has an independent governor, Bill Walker, who is a former Republican, but his running mate, his lieutenant governor, is a Democrat. And prior to Begich getting in the race, supposedly, this was the breaking report overnight, uh, governor Walker was actually going to run in the Democratic primary, but remain an independent. So he's sort of the de facto, would have been kind of the de facto Democratic nominee. But, you know, Alaska is a Republican leaning state. You have Bill Walker, who maybe is more of a Democrat than a Republican, and also Mark Begich running as a Democrat. It might be pretty hard for, you know, the Republicans might end up winning then because the mm. the the, uh, the Democratic vote could potentially get split there. So it, um, it's already June 1. This isn't kind of late to be announcing you're going to run. One would for... think so, although Alaska is not a heavily populated state. And Begich, of course, has name ID. In fact, his, um, you know, his father was a member of the U.S. House and died in a, a tragic plane crash uh, in the early 70s. But so, the, you know, the Begich name is been around in Alaska for a long time. Uh, and so if you're a candidate like that, you can maybe afford to get in a little bit later than uh, than somebody who has less name ID. But, okay. Uh, kind of an interesting interesting wrinkle overnight. All right. I know you and Larry keep track of all of these uh, races around the country, uh, governor's races, Senate races, House races. Um, what, what's your take generally on this, these midterms? So uh, the House, I think, is about 50-50 to flip to the Democrats. Uh, I think there were a lot of people who went a little bit further than that over the past several months, and that's not necessarily wrong, I, but um, the numbers have moved a little bit better for the Republicans in recent weeks. Uh, so anyway, I feel pretty good about 
just in terms of expressing, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the U.S. House result. I think the Republicans still are pretty clearly favored to hold the Senate just because the Senate map is so bad for the Democrats are defending almost all of their difficult seats this year. And they essentially would have to sweep the most competitive races to win. That, of course, is possible. And they, they kind of did that in 2012 when on this map they kind of surprisingly added to their majority Um but uh, so there's certainly a path for the Democrats to win the Senate, but I would not say that I, I would say that they're underdogs to do that. And then the governor's races, it's the exact opposite. The Republicans are defending a lot of ground, a lot of term limited incumbents. John Kasich is one of them. Rick Scott in Florida, Rick Snyder in Michigan, et cetera. Uh, the Democrats almost certainly will have more governorships in 2019 than they have now. It's just a question of sort of how many. They're, they're, their clearest and best pickup opportunities in Illinois, where um, Bruce Rauner, the Republican incumbent, is very, very unpopular and uh, Democrat J.B. Pritzker seems like a, a significant favorite uh, going into the general election. Uh, I'll come back to some of the Senate races because um, Democrats have to hold on to all their... The, the, yeah, like, all 26 uh, that they're defending. And that includes <laughs> Bernie Sanders and uh, of, of Vermont and Angus King of Maine, technically independents, but caucus with Democrats. Right. And then, and you've got the ones that are considered the most vulnerable, Heidi Heitkamp and John Tester, uh, Joe Donnelly, Claire McCaskill, and Joe Manchin, right. I guess, right? Um, which of those do you think is the most vulnerable? Probably McCaskill in Missouri. Um, really? She Not kinda, Donnelly? Yeah, I mean, the people, I think I think a lot of people will sort of classify like Donnelly, McCaskill, and Hyde Camp as sort of the most vulnerable. Hyde Camp mostly because the state is just so hard for a, de- for a, uh, for a Democrat. Uh, Donnelly and McCaskill in part because they, they benefited from weak opponents in 2012. Uh, you know, we'll see how you know how how good their opponents actually are this time. Uh, but I know that you know when, when you ask Republicans who they you know think are the, the most vulnerable ones, I think they generally name those three in some sort of order. And uh, Eric Greitens, the uh, governor of Missouri, uh, he f- he is finally out. Um, he is, uh, in fact, I think he is officially today's leaving the day. Today's, today's the day. Today's the day. Yeah. 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 Last day um, yeah. And what a fall for that guy who um, was being talked up as a presidential contender. You know, even sure. while he was still a candidate. Um, but just goes to show, you know, when you have these outsider candidates, they may not be quite as vetted as <laughs> as people who have won office before. So, uh, but yeah, he is going to be uh, he's going to be out, and that's a um, I think that's a relief to the state attorney general Josh Hawley, who is the likely Republican because it really uh, has put a cloud over the Senate Republican nominee. Party. Yeah, yeah, and and Hawley, of course, you know, chief law enforcement officer of the state, he's had to deal with some of this Greitens stuff. It's it's presented the split in the party. Uh, but the good thing for Hawley is that, you know, Greitens will be in the rearview mirror and this gives him time to sort of move move beyond that. So if they if, if Democrats are able to uh, hold on to those seats that they have to defend, then their pickups would come from either Arizona, Nevada or Tennessee. Tennessee. And yeah. the president was down in Tennessee this week for Marshall Blackburn up against Phil Bredenson. Uh, the president made some comment about Phil, who, like, I never heard of this guy, but yeah, Tennessee's heard of him. Uh, yeah, he's a I mean, two-term governor, pretty popular. I mean, when he won re-election in 2006, he, I, I think he won every county or, or, or almost every county, uh, and, uh, you know, totally romped in, in his re-election bid and, uh, you know, he hasn't run, been, you know, run for for election in a dozen years, but he seems to have a good image. Um, and if any Democrat could win in that state, you might think it would be someone like him. I'm still a little skeptical, uh, but uh, I, you know, I think we know that the Republicans are worried about it. In fact, that's why the president was there, I'm sure, because of, uh, you know, give a little hand to Marsha Blackburn. The, uh, the 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 uh, likely Republican uh, nominee, and so you know, yeah, the path is hold everything you got for the Democrats, twenty six total seats, and then to pick up two two more. And Arizona, and Nevada are probably the likeliest two, but then you'd maybe look at Tennessee. Uh, if everything breaks right, maybe Ted Cruz would be vulnerable in uh, in oh, Texas. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> um, by the way, I noticed that uh, Cruz was one of the first people to uh, to talk yes. about uh, the Dinesh D'Souza pardon. He, he pushed it all the yeah, way. He yeah, he did. It, it sounded like he actually had a hand in it. Yeah, and, yeah he's the one who raised it with Trump initially. I mean, not only was D'Souza's, um, and I think maybe you were talking about this earlier today, but um, not only were D'Souza's, you know, his, his, his crime, like totally obvious and it's a totally stupid thing to do. Um, but he's just such a toxic person, and that's you know that's not a reason somebody should go to jail. He went to jail for for he didn't go to reasons. jail. But he didn't right. go to jail. Oh, well, he didn't right, serve right. any time. Yeah, right. okay. But but was convicted of yeah. these of these. He was uh, convicted of, of uh, right, uh, which we know you're not allowed to do. You can't. Yeah, straw donor, straw scheme, donor right, things. Right. So, uh, but anyway, you know, that, just a little diatribe there. But I uh, mean, I remember when the first one I got involved in politics, 
it, my first campaign, that's one of the things you learn. No, you cannot ask somebody else. Like, for example, the classic was a business guy right. who wanted to help his friend and give them a lot of money, but he could only give, let's say, $1,000. Right? right. So we'd get everybody in his firm to write, people who tried this, yeah. to write a check for $1,000, and he would tell them, don't worry, I'll... You know, I'll pay you back. Well, and I you s- can't. I remember being drilled into you cannot do that. Tell people they can't do that. It's against the law. I saw some people yesterday saying, "Oh, well, you know, we shouldn't have contribution limits." And you know, he was he got railroaded. I'm thinking, well, maybe okay. we shouldn't have contribution but, limits. I don't we know, do. but like we do, and you can't yeah. you can't do what he did. Yeah, yeah, no, and he pretty guilty to it. I mean, he was there's no doubt, no doubt that he got two no people doubt. to write a ten thousand dollar check to. Wendy Long, who was a, his buddy, a horrible candidate, and got lost by a zillion points. But yeah. you know, the th- the thing about this that I think is so weird is Donald Trump and his supporters just don't care, right? Like to the fact that Ted Cruz, who is a, a legitimate politician, right? Like he's going to come out there and he's going to make this case that Dinesh D'Souza should be pardoned and should be a free man, ignoring the fact that what he did was illegal and wrong, ignoring some of the facts. That, like you said, he is a toxic human being with some of the, some stuff, of the, that other said. stuff that some he has said. Some of the stuff he said is horrible. Been, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and also, it's not like this conviction hurt D'Souza's career. I mean, he's still been, right. been a very prominent person. And, uh, yeah. and again, just, you know, the, the, the kind of person, you know, it just seems like, you know, all the worst people in America have a megaphone now. <laughs> yeah, and and, uh, and and I don't think that's necessarily just just uh, just but, the right. But I mean, it's but, it's you know. It, so you got we got off on this tangent about the Nash decision because yeah, you mentioned. Sorry about that, but no, yeah, it's all right. right. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. But you mentioned uh, Texas uh, and Ted Cruz, Beta O'Rourke. I must tell you, I hear more about him. As a candidate, than anybody else in the country. Yeah, I think he's an impressive. He has really it, it, had an impact. He's an impressive or candidate. He's, having he's, an he's raised a lot of uh, small dollar donations. Um, that said, I think it's a really heavy lift to to, well, to it's win Texas. Yeah, to win as a Democrat statewide. I mean, yeah, I mean there are lots of of uh, liberal pockets in that state, but uh, until some of the big. Um, Highly growing suburban counties start to start to really be in play for Democrats. It's hard to see how they really put it together um, uh, statewide. Don't you love the name though, Beto O'Rourke? He does. He has a uh, he has a great name. Uh, he's from, and he's an old uh, punker. He like he used to be in a punk rock band. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. is from uh, El Paso, and of course that's he's in a you great know candidate. Far, basically New Mexico, and so he, you yeah. didn't really have any name ID statewide, and so it, I mean, it seems like he's working hard. But you know, so whatever you whatever you want to say about Cruz, Cruz is a hard worker too. Cruz will have a very good campaign operation, uh, and so you know it would it would yeah. take it would take a significant um, right. significant wave and uh, kind of a perfect campaign for our work to really put it in play. Uh, talk about Arizona. I just can't believe I th- I consider it such a red state. It, you know, it's not as much anymore, but certainly it, it, it leans right of center. Uh, the Democrats have, I think, a pretty strong uh, candidate there in uh, Kirsten Sinema, who's a U.S. House member who, um, in coming up in local politics in Arizona, was seen as sort of a kind of almost like a fringe left person. And then as, as a House member, she's been sort of a more of a kind of a blue dog member, which, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of positioning herself to run statewide in Arizona, probably was, was a pretty smart thing to do. Her district... Kind of started off as a swing district, but it kind of has, has trended Democratic over time. And, you know, the Republican primary, you've got one strong candidate, Martha McSally, also a U.S. House member. Um, she holds basically Gabby Gifford's old seat, mm-hmm. know, effectively. Uh, and uh, But then you've got two kind of far-right fringe candidates, Joe Arpaio, another uh, recipient of a Donald Trump pardon, right. uh, the former Maricopa County Sheriff, and also Kelly Ward, a, a former state senator who... Uh, unsuccessfully challenged John McCain in 2016, and so I think the the hope for national Republicans is that Ward and Arpaio basically split kind of the far right vote, and McSally emerges as the consensus candidate, which is is probably what's the likeliest thing to happen there. Mm-hmm. And then McSally versus Cinema in the, in the general election, I think, would be very very competitive. Right. And Nevada, Dean Heller uh, considered the most vulnerable. Of- yeah, he's the only um, Clinton one state Republican on the Senate ballot this year. The, the Democrats are defending ten Trump state. Um, uh, senators this year, but uh, I think Heller's in a lot of trouble. Uh, his opponent is Jackie Rosen, who is a uh, first-term House member. Um, you know, I don't think she's 
a particularly well proven candidate, but I think that the combination of, of you know where that state I think is headed and the national environment you know should put her in a decent spot. But you know Heller won kind of surprisingly in 2012 uh, against another now former House member Shelley Berkeley. So I wouldn't necessarily count it count him out, but uh, certainly if the Democrats don't win Nevada, um, they're probably having a pr- pretty bad night uh, mm-hmm. in November. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, column is out today. Uh, I don't know if they posted it yet, Peter, but um, well, soon. Uh, called California, it's a jungle, uh, and it is. And the primary next Tuesday, uh, the jungle primary, California governor's race. I think probably one of the most interesting in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Gavin Newsom seems like and a the, lot riding on it too. I mean, California, yeah. you know, it's well, the fifth I mean, it's, largest economy in the world, right? Yeah, it's a, and. Uh, um, so Gavin Newsom, lieutenant governor, seems likely to advance to you know to the to, to the, the runoff Lead, round in leading November. The polls, right. Yeah, and then uh, there's a question as to whether a Democrat will advance to face him. Most likely, the former uh, mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villaraigosa. Uh, but then you've also got uh, a few Republicans running, and it seems to be this thought that John Cox, who's a Republican businessman, uh, will uh, advance and but. Newsom wants him to advance because he'd rather run against he, him than yeah. against Villarigosa. Because the California Jungle Primary, as we mentioned a couple of times, it's the top two vote getters. It doesn't matter what party, right? So it could be two Democrats, it could be two Republicans, it could be Democrat and a Republican, it could be anything. And but Gavin Newsom will be one of the two, right? The question is, he'd rather run against. This Republican John and, Cox. and Democrats in general would rather there be just two Democrats who advance because that th- that gives Republicans less incentive to turn out. And it seems like in the Senate race, um, two Democrats also will I- advance. Senator Feinstein right. and, and uh, so Kevin McCarthy has convinced Donald Trump to support John Cox yep. because they want a Republican up there for the same reason that that will incentivize Republicans to come out and vote for governor and therefore vote for other. House races while they're yeah, at and, it. Yeah, and, you know, as the Democrats try to win the House back, they, they, they need to probably need to squeeze even more seats out of California. Um, but here's the thing about that also is we ought to, uh, I think, recognize nobody believes John Cox could win. No, no. Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one in California. Yeah. It's been over a decade since a Republican won state. Right. And also, I mean, Schwarzenegger was, you know, not your traditional Republican either. Right. And... Um, John Cox, who ran, I mean, he ran, we were talking to you, he's sort of like the Alan Keys of California, because <laughs> he came from Illinois to California. Oh, really? He, okay, ran, yeah. he ran for House in California, lost. He ran for Senate in California and lost. Uh, I'm sorry, House in Illinois and lost. Ran for the Senate in Illinois and lost. He ran for president in 2008 in Illinois, <laughs> for president of the United States from Illinois and lost. Then he moved to California, and now he's running for governor of California. Well, and certainly, you know, a, a Donald Trump endorsement might be useful in a in you know getting consolidating Republican support out there, but certainly not in a general election. I wouldn't think so. Um, no, no. And no. but you know, the other wrinkle here is that uh, it, you know, as the Democrats trying to take the House back, they're they're targeting several yeah. seats across the state, uh, including several in uh, in Orange County, which used to be extremely Republican, is now kind of trending Democratic, and but, the Democrats believe that if they can advance candidates there to November, that they They can win those seats, but maybe they won't. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Simon Workman, Joseph Tidings, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.